So our next speaker is Lauren Ornelas, founder and president of the Food Empowerment Project. What I love about the Food Empowerment Project is that they advocate for marginalized humans as well as our fellow animals, not just because food justice is a vegan issue, but because it's the right thing to do. What I love about Lauren is that she demonstrates that ally is a verb. I'll illustrate this with a short story. In 2017, the Food Empowerment Project held an event at a venue in San Francisco. Laura and her crew put gender neutral signs up on the restroom doors. This helps make trans and gender nonconforming people like myself feel more comfortable and welcome. Now some of the employees at that venue complained, so Lauren personally spoke with them, as well as spending half an hour of her time on the phone with the manager to explain why these signs were necessary. Now as an attendee of that event, I especially appreciated this act of allyship, because I had performed in that venue myself just a few months after I began my gender transition. I'd been so nervous that day about using the men's room that I stood outside the restroom door for a good 10 minutes before I could work up the nerve to go in. And it took years before I felt confident enough to use men's restrooms without fear. And I still, as I am a gender, strongly prefer to use gender neutral restrooms where they are available. And that's why I'm so happy that they are available at this conference. So. <laughs> Thank you. So I really appreciate with, when cisgender people are aware of these issues and go out of their way to demonstrate allyship, not to earn praise for themselves, but because it's the right thing to do. And with that, I'm proud to introduce my friend, Lauren Ornelas. The first thing I would like to do is acknowledge that we are on stolen land. This is the land the Ohlone and the Chachiano people and we need to remember that this land is not ours, it is theirs, and so we gotta be kind with how we treat it and never forget what it is that happened to those people who this land once belonged to. Um, I have to say that Pax was telling that story about the Food Empowerment Project benefit, and I have to say that we also um, threatened to cancel our entire event the night of when people were coming. And I, it was one of those situations where it was the scariest thing for me. This is our anniversary party. Never done anything that big before ever, but recognizing there was no way that we could go on with our an event with an injustice like that taking place. And it was scary, but I knew that I would have the support of Food Empowerment Project supporters who would understand why we would have to make such a tough decision. So always packs. So I've never given this talk before and I may not be giving it now, Let's see if my slide comes back. Um, but, uh, so I don't know how much, how much time I'm gonna have for Q&A, but my goal is to provide time for Q&A, but it's mostly because I've never done this before, um, and I'm a little bit nervous. Um, so my name is Lorna Nellis. I'm the founder of Food Empowerment Project, and we are a vegan food justice organization, and I've been involved in the animal rights movement since 1987. Started the first animal rights group in my high school in Texas. And I've been doing this work for a very, very long time. And not even just, in, not just attending events, but actively organizing the events. And so I have this title for my talk because in some ways it is truly how I feel. And at the same time, I hope that most people who are here at this conference, and thank you Hope and Karen for putting this on, and allowing me to have a voice um, is so that you won't feel this way anymore. And you can encourage others not to as well. So I understand, as being somebody who's been doing this work for forever, I understand and 100% agree that non-human animals need us to fight for them with every breath that we take and everything that, is, that we do. When you consider the fact that vivisection and cosmetic testing is still going on in this country with animals like beagles and cats, um, who I love, bunnies, rats, mice, all sorts of animals being used in experimentation and for cosmetic testing, some of which isn't even required by law, I understand the need to focus on issues related to non-human animals, especially when you talk about vivisection. I was actually banned from the UC Berkeley campus for two years because of being arrested there and some activism I did there. So I absolutely understand this need. I also understand this need to work and fight against places um, that exploit non-human animals in entertainment. Um, here in our area, we have um, uh, Six Flags, 
um, which has uh, dolphins and other animals. So I absolutely understand when you know the horrible distress that these animals go through for entertainment, why we need to fight with them all the time. I also know why it is so important, and Sebastian talked about this brilliantly and with heart and his wonderful humor, um, but why we need to not, we need to keep fighting on all this stuff. I mean, I, have to, I happen to think that if we had not dropped the ball on every issue in the animal rights movement except for farmed animals, we'd be a lot further along when we look at cosmetic testing and when we look at fur. Bunnies are animals who I could actually be talking about all of these, right? They're killed for their fur, they're killed for their flesh, they're used in experiments. But I understand when we know these animals so well and so intimately why it is that we, so many of us, dedicate our entire lives and every day and every minute advocating for non-human animals. And when you look at those animals who are killed for food, which I'm assuming a lot of you are with UPC, that you understand the absolute need, and I don't need to explain why it's so important that we work on issues facing um, non-human animals who are killed for food, especially those brilliant little fish who are so smart that are never given the credit that they deserve for their individuality as well as the intense suffering that they feel. So I understand that. I, too, am somebody who dedicated my life to non-human animals. But when I look at somebody like Ellen, and this is my, and I know she's not vegan anymore, but she is a vegan who, for many of us in this room, at least for me and my friends, to have her go on when she was a vegan, talking and doing advertising for cosmetics companies that tested on animals was disgraceful. It was something that we were like, you're not vegan then. If you're supporting and you're promoting a company that tests on animals, you're not vegan. So don't use the word vegan. We have vegans um, in our movement who try to do things that are helpful, right? saying things like all lives matter, when we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement and why it's imperative, absolutely imperative, for black people in this country to not fear even just getting in their cars to drive somewhere. Why is something like all lives matter is problematic? When we talk about factory farm workers and slaughterhouse workers, when people talk about, you know, it's hard to have any sympathy for those people. And then ignorance when people say everybody has access to go vegan. Or when people use Cesar Chavez quotes to promote anything dealing with the animal rights movement and never talk about what he dedicated his life to, which were farm worker justice issues. And use these quotes to talk about every issue regardless if it impacts um, farm workers or the Latinx community at all. These are people who are making missteps. And it's offensive and it bothers a lot of people of color, vegan and non-vegan alike. And then worse, you have people who are outright racist saying things about black and brown people, and most especially right now, against the Chinese. I thought I would show some of these, but when I read them, I could not stomach it myself. I could not imagine myself talking about this stuff and showing the hatred and vitriol that vegans have towards black and brown people. It is too disgusting, and it felt like abuse. It felt like outright abuse if I was to inflict that on anybody else. My point here is saying that sometimes I think that vegans who don't care about these other issues don't, should not be talking about them. Because just like Ellen DeGeneres made misstep after misstep when she was vegan, vegans who don't care about these issues make missteps too, and it's harmful to those of us who actually care about these issues. It minimizes Cesar Chavez's work. It minimizes things like Black Lives Matter when people say things like All Lives Matter. So there's a disservice that's done. But what I'm hopeful for is that maybe I can get some of you to broaden your circle of compassion. Maybe I can get you to think about things differently. Maybe I can get you to understand that your lived experience is not my lived experience. And it's so different for all of us. So what I'm going to do is um, show you, and this is not my slide. Um, you're going to know, know when my slides come back on. These are different people's slides that I'm showing you because I'm trying to make a point. And for those of you who live in California, you know Modesto. 
for those of you who don't know California, Modesto is a town in the Central Valley which predominantly Latinx um, communities live in. I'm a proud Mexican, I'm a Chicana, I'm a Hicanax. Um, and so I'm very proud about that. But in this community, what I'm gonna be showing you is how racism takes place, how it unfolds in ways that we don't even know exist. Just like we always try to tell people who don't eat animals, you don't know what happens in factory farms, you don't know what happens in all these different situations, I wanna remind you that you may not know what's happening all the times in certain communities. So again, these are the Cedar Grove Institute for Sustainable Communities. This is their slideshow. The only thing we did was adjust the word Hispanic because we do not use the word Hispanic, so it says Latinx. Even though that's not our preferred term either, it's the best for the slideshow. So what it is, is we're gonna, I'm gonna be showing you a community called Modesto and what happens when they are um, incorporating it. So what is at stake when you are incorporated? So we're talking about a communities maybe a communities that are unincorporated, meaning that they are still part of the county, but they're not part of a city yet. So when you are incorporated, like probably a lot of people here live in incorporated cities, you have things like paved roads, you have, you have lights, you have police protection. Okay, let's question that one. Um, you have trash pickup, you have water, you have sewage, you, have, you can vote for people who are supposed to be looking out for you. And, you, and you, you feel wanted when you're part of these. When you're not part of these, you feel like, who's looking after me? So the incorporation has these, basically what they're calling essential foundations that helps to create cohesive communities. You're part of something, you're part of a city. So let's think about it. If you live in Santa, say, well, San Francisco is like the worst example because it's the county and the city. So I'll use Marin County, which is incredibly wealthy. So if you live in Marin County, which is a very wealthy county, but you, all, you live in San Rafael, which is a city there, right? You feel part of your city just as much as you feel part of your county. But if you don't even have a city, you're not even a part of anything. You're a part of this county which surrounds everything. So what's happened here is that in Modesto, what I'll show you is they started to incorporate different parts of the community, right? So there's a whole bunch of area, and they slowly, starting in 1961, started to create portions of this to become the city. The majority of the people who lived in the unincorporated areas were Latino. We would say Latinx. Um, so I'm gonna show you one of these areas. If you look on the left-hand side of this area, you can see a, oh, sorry. Uh, the right-hand side for you. You can see a sidewalk. Oh, <laughs> oh it is. <laughs> I just really don't know my right from my left, and I can't add either. Um, so you can see that one side, I'll say one side has a sidewalk and the other side doesn't, right? So you can guess which one's incorporated, right? So even something as simple as a sidewalk is not going to happen for the, what, predominantly Latinx community living there. So now I'm going to take you to this, and I'm going to go through this fast, but you'll be able to see what's happening. But basically, you're going to be looking for um, the red areas. And you're going to slowly see these um, blue stripes. So they're going to start to slowly incorporate the community. But everything in red is what you'll kind of start to notice. So this is 1961, 62, 63. I'm going to keep on going. And I'm going to go up through 2004 and you should be able to see what's happening. So you could see there what was happening, right? They were incorporating everywhere, but what the Latinx community was living, maybe a few other ones. So what this does to communities is pretty devastating. And when I'm talking, again, this is my learned knowledge from the people who actually created this, who are actually living there. You know, I, this is not my life, this is not my wisdom, this is literally coming from them. But when we're talking about these areas, we're not only talking about them making sidewalks for one side and not the other side, we're actually even talking about things like sewage and water to where the pipes will end. 
the trash pickup will end. When you have an area where there's no sidewalks, nothing like that, that means that the people, as you can see in this picture, um, she's walking her daughter to school in the street. This also means when you don't have sidewalks, you're going to get muddier, right? You're going to get dirtier, and then you go to school dirty. And then what does everybody think of you? You're dirty. You're poor. You lose respect from the people who you're going to school with. So this creates a very bad situation for the, you know, and I'm going to say here, this is the Latinx community leaving Modesto. This is taking place all over the country, right? Black, brown people all over the country. And so this creates so many things that's happening to them, right? You can see a few listed here. So that's hopefully what I'm trying to show you is why for some of us, being a single issue activist is not possible. Because the same empathy that we've given to non-human animals is the same empathy and compassion we have to our fellow human beings as well. That we understand that our experiences are different and in some ways similar. Especially those of us who are black and brown, we have our shared experiences thanks to racism. We have the fact that racism impacted our ability to advance much in society. The fact that it impacted for those of us, especially me, um, having even access to healthy foods or even food growing up. So for some of us, it's something we can't ignore. It's not a privilege, right? It's a privilege that we can't say, oh, I only care about non-human animals, I don't care about people. To us, it's all the same. And that's not to say that there are some black and brown vegans out there who don't care about these issues, because there absolutely are. But the fact is, is that what I'm asking people to do is to start to do everything that we're asking people who consume animals to do is just listen and think and learn and be willing to open our minds. So for Food Empowerment Project, some of the work we do on this issue, <clears throat> heavily we work we do, is working on farm worker justice issues. And the reason for that is because we are a movement that comes across as very sanctimonious. Um, and I'm glad somebody giggled there because we know it's true. Um, and we shouldn't be that way, right? Because the, the fact is, is that our food, unless you're growing and eating all the, your own food that you grow, you have a farm worker to thank for it. And that is not cruelty free. That is not coming without a price. That is coming with a heavy price for farm workers who are, um, many of whom are homeless, many of whom don't even have um, fresh access to fresh fruits and vegetables that they're picking. The average lifespan of a farm worker is 49 years old. That's how old I am, at least for the next week. <laughs> so, you know, the reality is, is that farm workers, thank you. I have so much to say that I'm like, I need to know when I'm almost halfway through. Um, Farm workers are the ones picking our food. And in fact, as an organization like Food Empowerment Project, we're trying to get more people to eat produce, right? So for us, we have a responsibility to make sure that those farm workers who are picking our food that we're trying to get more people to consume are treated with dignity and respect. So how do we do this? One of the ways Food Empowerment Project does it is that we organize a school supply drive for the children of farm workers every year. And for everybody in this room, and I know there's a lot of you here, whoever donated to that, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, because we get the joy of handing these school supplies filled with so much goodness for them. Um, we don't do this as an act of charity. We do this to help right an injustice that's taking place. We do this to thank the farm workers for all that they do for us. We do this so their kids know that they're superstars and that they succeed in this world because that's what the parents, that's what the farm workers are doing. Everything that they're doing for is for their children. We also are trying to encourage you to please boycott companies that farm workers themselves are asking you to. So the difference between doing this type of work for human animals versus non-human animals is the farm workers can actually tell us what they want us to do. We make assumptions when it comes to non-human animals, rightly so. They don't want to be harmed and killed and exploited. But for the farm workers, they're asking us. They're saying, please boycott Wendy's, right? Because Wendy's will not pay the farm coalition of Immokalee workers has a campaign to get them to pay one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. One penny per pound. And Wendy's hasn't done that. 
So vegan burger, vegan french fries, doesn't matter. You boycott them and you tell them why if you want to advocate for the rights of farm workers. We also are asking people to boycott Driscoll's berries. Now Driscoll's berries is the vast majority of berries that are sold. What I've done is every time I went in, I would tell them, I wish you'd sell something other than Driscoll's berries. And a lot of times they do. And this is in honor of the San Quintin farm workers in Mexico who are asking us to boycott Driscoll berries for things, as, things such as wage theft. But we also need to look globally at our food and how our food impacts non-human animals as well, to the point where when people sell vegan chocolate bars, they like to say things like they're cruelty free. But what is, the reality is, is that you have slavery and child labor taking place right now for chocolate, predominantly taking place in Western Africa and Brazil. Um, here, this is a photo from 2013 of some young girls in a Rainforest Alliance certified farm. You can see scars on their arms and the legs from the machetes. This was the quote that got me to look at chocolate differently. When a Western reporter asked former slaves, what would you say to Westerners who still eat chocolate? And the former slave said, tell them when they're eating chocolate, they are eating my flesh. And I thought this is the same thing as a non-human animal would say. There's no way I can look at chocolate in the same way again. I have a responsibility to not support what's happening against human beings. And again, a perfect way to remind us that we absolutely want that chocolate bar to be free of cow milk and goat milk, but we also want it to be free of slavery and child labor. So what we have is we have a list of chocolates that we do and do not recommend. Every company has to make at least one vegan chocolate to make our list. We update this list every month. We also have it in a free app. So if you have an iPhone or an Android, you can download it for free. From our website, I'm sorry, we have a table out front. From our table, if you have an iPhone, you can just scan it, a uh, barcode that we have, and it'll download it automatically. So we ask people to please use this list. So one of the other areas that I feel like vegans truly misunderstand is areas that are called food apartheid areas. Uh, many people hear of them called food deserts. But food deserts is a, is a huge euphemism. Uh, but these are areas that lack access to healthy foods, where you have more fast food restaurants and then you have like places for people to buy fresh food. Now this is not just a national issue, this is an international issue. I've spoken in New Zealand where the Māori are the most impacted, and quotes from them look exactly like the quotes from people in Oakland, where the problem of the lack of access to healthy foods is so similar. And I'm going through all of this really fast. I do talk just on these issues, but I'm trying to condense, so I apologize if I'm going to be going through this fast. So Food Empowerment Project, I used to live and work in downtown San Jose, which is south of here, known in an area called Santa Clara County. And it's where Cesar Chavez got his organizing start with the United Farm Workers, which he co-founded with Dolores Huerta. And I think it's always important to remind everybody that the Great Boycott was actually started um, by the Filipinx um, farm worker activist as well as Cesar Chavez. So Larry Itliong um, started that. So very important to recognize that. But this is where there were orchards everywhere in Santa Clara County. And so just fruit produce everywhere. And for me, coming from Texas, it was amazing to see fruit growing on trees. That was wild. Um, but so I decided, I lived and I worked in downtown San Jose where I had two liquor stores across the street from each other where I lived and where I worked. And I thought, I've been hearing this stuff about a lack of access to healthy foods, really then called food deserts. Um, and I thought, I wonder if this is happening here. And I had a full-time job and so I gathered some Food Empowerment Project volunteers and I had a full-time job doing something else. And we went around and we surveyed the high-income areas and low-income areas in the, in the county to see if there was a discrepancy, which of course we knew there would be, but we also know that policymakers really like numbers. So we went and we physically surveyed every establishment, um, fast food, not fast food, not fast food, not restaurants, but liquor stores, convenience stores, gas, store, gas stations for access to healthy foods. And we put out this report which is on our website in English and in Spanish, um, talking about our findings, which included there was 11 times more access to frozen vegetables in the higher income areas. Um, so from there, um, 
we went and we did focus groups in the most impacted communities. And one of the reasons why is because too many times well-intentioned NGOs and government officials go into communities telling them what they need. And then they wonder why they fail and they want to blame it on black and brown communities when it doesn't work, when they haven't even done the work to talk to the communities first. So we went in and we did our three Spanish focus groups um, to find out the barriers that they faced and what they thought some of the solutions would be. And some of the interesting stuff that came out was one that a lot of the, the family had kids who were vegan that a lot of them already were preferring dairy alternatives because they had a longer shelf life than milk does. So if they couldn't get to the grocery store, that was better for them to have. But one of the biggest problems that we found for anybody accessing healthy foods was the actual cost. It wasn't even proximity, it was the cost. So that's when we started to really promote living wages as a way to help create some equity, right? So living wages, we encourage everybody to fight for living wages for restaurant workers, fast food workers, state, city, any, anybody. And, and we say living wages. That's, I mean, 15 hour is somewhat okay. We want more than that, right? Because if everybody, if everybody loves, every vegan doesn't want people to consume non-human animals anymore. The only way they're gonna be able to do it is so that they can afford the food, right? But more so, it should be everybody's right to be able to access healthy foods, regardless of anything else. But we're not gonna be able to do that unless we create some equity. We need to create some balance. So when I talk about getting really annoyed when vegans say it's easy for anybody to go vegan, it's because of situations like this, which I took in Vallejo, California. And this is a, a, a convenience store, and I know it's blurry. One day I will have time to go take a non-blurry picture of this. But basically, this is their produce. This is what's available to them. Some potatoes, some onions, and a few bananas. And some of the potatoes on the bottom are already getting rotten. So if this is the only access you have to fresh produce, how easy is it going to be for you to go vegan? It's not. It's not at all. And to ask anybody to is unfair and unhealthy. So Food Empowerment Project follows environmental justice principles. So we only go into other people's communities when we're asked to. So we were asked by one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party, David Hilliard, to come take a look in Vallejo. So Vallejo is between here and Sacramento, if you're not from this area. It's in that area. So we did that. But we decided just to look at this city because that city is very diverse. It's black, Latinx, and Filipinx. And we decided to take a look at lack of access to healthy foods there. And we put out our report. And what we found was that 88% of all the liquor stores and 71% of all the convenience stores in the city were in the low income areas. We found, you can see the charts up there, but if you look at the low income and high income areas and you look at the grocery stores, that's the reality for many black and brown communities and even indigenous um, here in the United States. Because we're forced to be getting the majority of our food from liquor stores and convenience stores because there are no grocery stores. So in fact, there's a way, to, there's a system in which it's called NAICS, it's a USDA system to where how grocery stores um, and liquor stores can classify each other. And a lot of liquor stores are calling themselves grocery stores because there's nobody to even confirm if it's really a grocery store or not. So, um, and I apologize for people who couldn't read that other slide. You can, I can show it to you. I'm not very good at numbers, like I already told you all. So I said. So we also, okay, so all the surveying they do, we make sure that our survey tools are culturally appropriate. So the one in San Jose was, or in Santa Clara County was predominantly for Latinx community. The one in Vallejo had to be for Latinx, Black, and Filipinx foods. Because we want to make sure, it's also important that food be culturally appropriate for the communities. But we also always survey for meat and dairy alternatives, right? One reason is because we're a vegan group. We don't want anybody harmed. We don't want non-human animals to be part of the, the quote unquote table. We also know that thanks to the American Dietetic Association, we know that a diet in more fruits and vegetables is better for your health, which is incredibly important. We also know that a lot of people can't digest cow's milk or goat milk. And for those of us who are from lands that were colonized, um, we know that it's a product of colonization. Sebastian referenced that I talk about this a lot. Um, but I, at being a Mexican, um, Columbus brought the cows over on his fourth voyage. 
So that really wasn't normal for my people, my ancestors, to be consuming cow's milk. But as Sebastian mentioned as well in his talk about this fear of what happens if you eat too many vegetables, the fear from the Spaniards was that if they began to eat like the native people, were they going to turn into them? Were they going to turn into savages? So they had to bring all their European foods over and obviously melded with my ancestors' food. But what happened is, is that now, today, where this legacy of colonization is everywhere, we are still impacted by that, right? Because we're called lactose intolerant if for some reason we can't digest the milk of another species, which seems pretty normal. Um, so we call that term lactose normal. We kind of say quit putting the onus on people of color as if there's something wrong with us that we don't digest the milk of another species. There's nothing wrong with us. This is a product of colonization, and it's a weird one. Um, but no, we are lactose normal, that we do not digest the milk of another species. And that's how it should be. So we have found, as you can see, that dairy alternatives were pretty much, they weren't very um, representative. Only 16 stores in the entire Vallejo even had meat alternatives or dairy substitutes. So again, when we're going in these communities and we're trying to say, you need to go vegan, that's a lot of guilt. I'm somebody who grew up without, um, you know, my mom didn't have a job for a while. I had to work fast food even though I was vegan. Um, I experienced a lot um, working that job, which you can imagine, and if you know anything about the fast food industry. Um, but this is how it is for a lot of people. And we need to be smarter when we talk about this stuff. The only food I could eat was food that people brought us. I went vegetarian when I was in elementary school. Um, but I couldn't stick with it because we didn't have the ability to, for me to. So in doing this work in Vallejo, one of the things we found was that um, Albertsons owns Safeway. There was a Safeway in downtown Vallejo which is predominantly where a senior living facility was and black and brown people were living. And they had moved their grocery store out of downtown and relocated to another area miles away. And when they left, they put what's called a restrictive deed on their former property. And that restrictive deed prevented any grocery store from moving into that location for 15 years, which means that community was deprived of having access to any fresh produce that means that teenagers, when we started our work doing in that community, never knew what it was like to have a grocery store in their community because they got all their food from the convenience stores and liquor stores. We found that Safeway has done this around the country. There's an amazing city council member who's constantly fighting Safeway from doing this in her community in DC. It's happening in Washington State, a farm worker community there. Their restrictive deeds have gone from 15 to 30 to 60 years where they're preventing grocery stores from moving in. We have a petition on our website. We have a petition on our table and leaflets. We're asking you to please sign and promote this petition. If this petition had been for something about non-human animals, we would have a heck of a lot more signatures than we do right now. So we need your help. So um, after we did our work, we, again, we went out and we did focus groups. And when we do our focus groups, like the one I mentioned earlier, we, fee we give everybody $50 for their time because what they're giving us is wisdom and it deserves to be compensated. We also fed everybody vegan food. Um, so we put out our report. We have some on our table in English and in Spanish as well. One of the bigger barriers, again, was cost. And then I just want to highlight that a lot of the people who were immigrants in our communities ate better where they lived than now in the United States because they were used to growing their own tomatoes. And now they were forced to buy tomato sauce because they didn't have access to the fresh tomatoes. So we did our focus groups. We talked about things. Uh, we, we had the answers from them, right, as always. But we brought up two interesting things just to see what they thought of them. One was, would you be more willing to buy produce that was grown locally by people you know? And have you ever heard of a worker-owned cooperative? We did six fo seven focus groups in Vallejo, and only one person in these focus groups had ever heard of a worker-owned cooperative. So if, just so you all know, worker-owned cooperative means the workers own that cooperative. They make the decisions. They make all the decisions, including the profit. Membership-owned cooperatives are owned by, run by a board, not by the workers. And that board makes the decisions. 
So we support worker-owned cooperatives. So what we did is we brought Adriana from Mandela Grocery in Oakland to come and talk to everybody. We had three meetings to talk about worker-owned uh, cooperatives. And that's what we're trying to get in Vallejo now, is a worker-owned cooperative, so that that money stays in the community and doesn't go back to Walmart's money in Arkansas. We also put on a Vallejo Healthy Food Fest, which is not any type of veg fest you'll ever see, at least that I've seen, because it's really only community-based. We only have local communities come and table, the NAACP, Vallejo People's Garden. We have local chefs, Chef Chu, who many of you may know, who owns the Veg Hub in Oakland. He actually always does cooking. We have vegan food all day um, for people. All day long, people can try free vegan food. Um, and those of you who are supporters, thank you for making sure this happens because we can never get grant money for it because people who do food justice work say, we don't think veganism is the path to food justice. Chef Chu now has, makes vegan mock meats in Vallejo. So this is just uh, one of our pictures from the event. And we always say my first vegan event because we know people have eaten peanut butter and jelly sandwiches before, so it's not their first vegan meal. We also have, we have speakers from the community and we have performers um, from the community, predominantly focusing on black, Latinx, and um, Filipinx, food, chefs, and performers. So all of this and a heck of a lot more that I couldn't talk about is all on our website and it's in English and in Spanish. We also have vegan Mexican food in English and in Spanish. And my crew likes food, so they put a lot of pictures of food in here. Um, our shout out to, we do have vegan Mexican food booklets. Um, which you can contact us to get um, on our website. A little UPC love there with the little the chicken and the rooster. Um, and we also have vegan, uh, our web, vegan Mexican food is in English and Spanish. We also have vegan Filipinx food. My colleague is a proud Filipina. And um, so we do have vegan Filipino food in um, English and Tagalog. We will be making that into a booklet this year. We also are working on vegan Lao food because one of our wonderful board members is Lao, but we need recipes, so if you know of anybody. So quick things that you can do. I'm going to go through this super fast because I have more I want to say. Go vegan if you have access to healthy food. Shop with care. I'm, I'm just going to dip. If you can't read them, it's because they're really tiny. Sorry. I, it used to be 10 things you can do, and then I increased it to 15. <laughs> So our new, we're coming out with a new booklet, and the new one is going to have 15. I'm like, everybody's acting like 10 is easy. i got to make this harder. So I know some of you are reading this, but I'm going to just go on for a little bit. So I hope that you see what I'm saying here, that oppression is oppression no matter what form it takes. And for us to fight against injustices, it should be all of them together because they are connected. Fighting for non-human animals is not something that I think anybody should not do. I think everybody should be doing it. What I would like for vegans and animal rights activists to do is stop acting like those of us who fight for human rights or for, our, for other black and brown or indigenous communities is somehow taking that fight away. We're not taking anything away. We're adding to it. We're adding that wider circle that we're asking for other people who consume animals to do. We're asking you to not say stupid things. Um, we're asking you to not allow people to disparage our work because the work that Food Empowerment Project does is four parts, and one of those four parts is veganism. And I feel like the rest of the three are just as involved. We can't get people to go vegan if they can't access healthy foods. It's the same thing. We can't show that we are truly compassionate people if we talk about farm workers in the way that we allow people to talk about them sometimes. And I like to always just remind people that for me, um, some, of my, some of my heroes in my world are people who thought wider than, the, and I'm going to switch slides because I want you to stop reading that, um, are people who understood that you can fight for more than one thing at a time. I'm not asking people to fight for, non, for, for anything other than animals if they want to. But try to be consistent in your own ethics. The animals need us absolutely. But if you can be more consistent in the things you say and the things that you do, that goes a long way. Because people hear you. And if you say things like it's easy to go vegan and there's somebody who hears that and says, I know my aunt couldn't go vegan, everything you've just said is gone. 
So let's just try to be more mindful about what we say. So I was gonna, some of my heroes are people who have understood that doing, you can do everything. You don't lose one without the other. When you're drinking water and eating, it's not that you're having to make a choice. You're doing them both. Frederick Douglass was one of the most amazing people who saw this, right? He fought for the abolition of slavery, but he also was a strong advocate for the woman's right to vote. Fighting for his own, he didn't say, uh, no. Mine now, years later. He said, why not fight for them both? We have Cesar Chavez, who was a vegan, who spent his life, and I would say lost his life, to his fight for farm workers. And we have Martin Luther King Jr., who didn't become dangerous, didn't really become dangerous until he started talking about the plight of the janitors when he started to speak against the Vietnam War. That's when Martin Luther King he came da most dangerous. It's because he started connecting these issues. And what happens when he started connecting these issues? All of a sudden, the following gets bigger, right? And it shouldn't be about the following, right? We shouldn't be like, oh, I should do this because maybe they'll like me. That's like the wrong way to do anything. But we should start to look at these other issues and realize we all have things to learn. I'm constantly learning, and I'm constantly losing foods I can eat. But I'm constantly learning and trying to do my best. So that's all I'm asking you to do, is to remember that we all have a lot of work to do. And the only way we're going to be a true force to be reckoned with is when we start building that bridge instead of breaking them down. Or I should say, breaking down that wall. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to add that um, as someone interested in city planning, I know there's a level of bureaucracy that you have to deal with. So um, how do you get past that if people are reluctant or um, are you getting the citizens and the people to voice their concerns with the government? Great question. Um, I have no faith in the federal government, um, but I don't think I really ever have. I do think that city and local is where we should be doing everything all the time. Um, we have had the year in Vallejo. We've met with the mayor. We do have support of the, some of the city council members. We've had meetings with the leaders in the community with the mayor. And um, yeah, they say a lot behind closed doors, but when it comes to do something out in the world, not so much. Um, so we have a way now that we're thinking we're gonna go about it. But um, they, the mayor told me at one point he was committed to two worker-owned cooperatives in Vallejo. Um, and we've had Mandela reach out to them as well. So, but it's just a matter of they're not doing enough in my opinion, so thanks. Hi, thank you so much uh, for everything. On your website, is there a, a list of worker-owned cooperatives in certain areas, or what are some resources you'd recommend so we can become more knowledgeable and, and support those, sure. those organizations? Um, there is a website for worker-owned cooperatives that you can go to. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. I know that they're far and few in between. Um, I, there's none in Sonoma County. Um, Mandela is the only one I know, and Rainbow here in the Bay Area. Rainbow's also a worker-owned cooperative. And other avenues, thank you.